Rodney Charter. Welcome to the Digital Scene Show here at uh, Collision Expo. Mm -hmm. And you just finished presenting. You are um, the DP of 24. Correct. So, um, you know, for the people that are starting out wanting to get into indep uh, independent filmmaking, DPing, mm -hmm. shooting, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what, what does your job entail? Um, my job is quite complex in that I'm the senior technician uh, on the team. Uh, roughly 200 people, uh, half of them I don't see, they're either ahead of us or behind us. Uh, but there are around hardcore 60 to 100 people that work under me, sort of. Uh, directly about 30 do, the electricians, the, the grips and the camera department, and I have operators. And I'm responsible for uh, making sure that whatever's performed by the actors winds up on film and can be played back and become right. a show. Uh, I don't do any of the editing or anything, that's a separate post field but on the floor while we're shooting uh, I'm the guy that uh, is sits beside the director and uh, helps to realize his vision. Now you're very involved in the look of it as well correct the final look uh, does that include in the colorizing of it as well or? Yes um, Kodak film tends to be fairly out of the box uh, normal and if you are striving to create a different look, first, of course, you have to have the production designers on side with you to paint the walls with certain colors and costume it, a costume in a certain way. And after that, it's up to how you light it and whether or not you're using uh, gels. And then when you get to the lab, uh, whether or not you're enhancing certain colors and making other colors more mute uh, and overall diffusion levels or um, contrast curves, gamma relationships between mm -hmm. highlights and shadows, and all of that is done in post-production in tools that are not unlike color. Color is uh, Apple's Final Cut right. Pro package is uh, for free now. It's just as sophisticated as any of the tools that I use, although mine tend to not need to render, and uh, Apple's need to render, but they're identical in all other respects. I see. And um, now you, you mentioned film, so that means you guys are shooting 24 in film. We, we certainly started out that way and, and we've been going nine years actually during our production. In that time, uh, there's been a definite shift to digital, uh, but many of the uh, qualities that our film, uh, grain, we enhance grain, we shoot in industrial locations in very low light very often and we kind of like that grain. It, it's sure. sort of a character in the sort of series that gives you a little creepy feeling and mm -hmm. and uh, there's, there's a quality about it which is great and the digital cameras tend to be a lot cleaner and they're f more difficult to give uh, kind of a fabric to than that the random is, kind uh, of green. It's more expensive unquestionably, but I think the results in the end are more satisfying. And uh, I know digital will get there eventually, but at the moment I don't think it's completely satisfying as a shooting tool. Right. Do you, do you see um, 24 shooting in digital as it gets there, or pretty much you think? For this year, certainly, we have put that to bed, but there was a, a lot of pressure to, to shoot digital. Was that pressure because to try a new technology, or was it mainly cost? No, I think it's the cost. It's a cost issue. Uh, it's also, it falls in line with a green policy that, that uh, oh, okay. they have at Fox. Um, so it would have been shooting tapeless? Well, yes and no. Um, the archiving of digital media is still a big challenge. Yeah. Um, LTO drive archiving costs you around, for all the media that you would shoot for a two hour movie is around 13000 a year, versus about $400 to put it in the salt mines with the film. Mm. Uh, so that, if you're going to put something on the shelf and in 20 years you want to pull it out again, uh, that's a big chunk of money that's suddenly gone. Uh, you p might recoup it, you might not. Uh, they're very happy just with spending the 400 for the salt mine. Sure, sure. So um, what, do you see the future of, talking about sticking with tapeless and archiving, because that's a big issue with tapeless right now, yeah. is the archiving and the fact, like you mentioned, you shoot something tapeless now, you archive it and put and come out 20, 30 years later, can you even play it back? Correct. Right, with film, I mean, you only need is basically sure a projector. Be, you know, and projector lying around yeah. it, they'll be able to tell something. Exactly. Yes. So do you, do you see um, the industry correcting that somehow, coming up with a standard? The problem is that we are deeply involved with a post-workflow stream, which has been in existence for a long time and hasn't changed much for 20 years. Uh, the telecines, um, the spirits, uh, going to tape stock at D20, uh, D uh, rather D5 or SR, mm -hmm. um, and the act final 
uh, air master winds up on tape and on the shelf and there's a clone made and they're stored in somewhere else. Tape is pretty satisfying for that. But in the field, uh, shooting with digital uh, media is hugely more uh, like film, basically. Right. You have mags that come and go, but they change quickly and uh, we archive them. And, uh, and it's great to be able to see stuff play back and there are a lot of advantages. Uh, where it's falling down is in uh, most of the editors have not gone into, so we still send them a tape. We, it's crazy. They, <laughs> they should be getting a drive from the sure. post house, but we still send them a tape, and then they redigitize. And uh, we're not alone. There are you know around 100 shows in L.A. shooting drama, and I would say most of them are still not tapeless. Right. And mostly because it's a very conservative town, very conservative industry, especially in post, and nobody really wants to change. And you have these big post houses that have massive infrastructure involved in tape decks. Right. You know, our, our house has something like 400 tape decks, mm -hmm. and suddenly they've gone. They don't need them anymore. Well, no, we're still paying for them and right. we're going to use them. Thank you very much. So from an economic perspective, because of all the investment people have done, tape will be around for a while. So. I suspect so. There's a, there's a satisfaction of, of knowing that you have a tape on the shelf. And now we still have a film archive as well, but the tape one is the one they, they worry about and that's the one they shuntle around and dub and send all their various versions about with. Um, it's attractive, the idea of going digital, but I can't see it happening until... Sure better uh, archiving storage, something that is larger capacity than an LTO drive, some kind of laser-based system, is really we desperately need a holographic storage system that has right. a terabyte on it without any effort. And it's right. drive within 10 minutes, you've got a terabyte trial pass. And something over. that you can read 10 years from now. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And, and th that's not to say that you won't be able to, but there's all this fighting going on as usual between different sure. formats and the companies have a great deal invested in them. You know, we saw the Blu-ray, the fight alone probably almost killed Blu-ray from ever being as successful as they wanted it to be because mm -hmm. they had these two systems out there, which is insane, you know, why well, then sure. they figure it out before they actually put the thing on the market, it would be great. But.